Jack, I'm not seeing anything here on the El Paso. I'm just seeing, waiting for the presenter to start the meeting. Uh, what is your webinar ID? Is it show? It said I'm showing 70-some folks on the webinar. Hopefully they're seeing the agenda screen. Anybody? Yeah, I'm calling from Seattle. I don't see anything other than just waiting for organizer as well. Waiting for organizer. I'm in the Little Rock and Seattle. I see the webinar intro. I'm calling from Seattle and I see it fine. You see but the there was that new news this morning. Do you see the you see the agenda on your screen? Yes. And it's because there was a message saying that well, part of the thing had changed. But right, that might have been communication only. Right, yeah, just the phone line change. So hopefully the webinar should be still good for all. It shows up on my screen. Yeah, I wonder if we're running into some kind of bandwidth issues in certain places. Uh, Jamie, are you good out there? Yeah, I can see your screen fine. We'll have to probably Jack, this is J. Yeah. Uh, this is JJD. I'll, I'll read you uh, the webinar ID I'm using just to see if it's the same as yours. Is uh, one 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 zero one five nine one five. Is that the right one? And no, I'm showing it starts off as a one two eight. Okay, I think that may be the problem. So uh, if you, uh, I think. Have everybody go to uh, go to webinar um, and do join a meeting or join excuse me join a webinar and then if you could read off those uh, read off your nine digit one. Okay, let me try that. Yeah, I guess if they're not on the webinar, let's see here. Uh, well, the webinar ID I have is 128-761-563 for those on the phone that don't have that ID. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what where that would have come from unless it made a new ID based on the tweak. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to do the... Um all right, I'm showing 81 folks on there, so let's go ahead and move on, and we'll hope the others can catch up. Again, that webinar ID is 128-761-563 for those that may not have that number. All right, so the agenda for today is that we're going to probably have a pretty full hour. Jamie's going to go ahead first. Uh, Jamie is the... The senior service uh, hydrologist out there in, Los, in, in WFO Weather Forecast Office, Los Angeles. And because he is in Los Angeles, he is a rock star like all people in Los Angeles. And he is, uh, if you can see on the agenda here, um, I've linked his name. He, he's an award-winning story map maker for the National Weather Service. He was recognized at last summer's Esri International Users Conference uh, with a special achievement award for his efforts. So he's a, he's a wonderful speaker here and, and knows this stuff backward and forward for as much as uh, until it changes, which is always changing. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Jamie here and give him controls, and we'll move through his uh, material, okay? Jamie, you okay, good morning, everyone. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, yes we got it. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to present probably for about 30 minutes today. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of background about what story maps are. And then I'm going to show some samples of some story maps that I've done and show you, give you some ideas about how we could use story maps um, in the weather service. And then I'm going to go into some slides that talk about um, some of the steps about how to create story maps. And then I'll end up with some, uh, where you find a bunch of information to, to get you started. 
So um, I am not going to be using a PowerPoint today. Um, what you're seeing on the screen is actually a story map. So I'm going to be presenting um, with one of my story maps. Um, okay, so we're going to start off with you know what are story maps? Story maps are um, you know we're traditionally in our GIS we've we've worked on our desktop and we've had this desktop software and we can make maps. Story maps as we've created this new way to integrate your your mapping your so the, those maps you make on your desktop with um, text and videos and images. To put it all together into this little app that you um, becomes a web URL that you share with people and they can view it, um, but it allows you to put it all together and tell this story um, in combination with your map. Got uh, plenty of Mountain Dew and there's um, <laughs> It sounds like we have a, some. If everyone could mute their lines, that'd be great. I was hearing a little bit of background noise. Um, so story maps, um, they're they're not designed to do your heavy lifting in GIS, um, but you can do some analysis within them if you want. Um, they're designed for like a general non-technical audience, um, and they're just they're accessible to anyone that has access to the internet. So I'm going to uh, so that was a quick intro. I'm going to show you some samples of them, and then we'll go into um, how you create these. So this. This particular story map that I'm showing on the screen right now is called, um, the template is called uh, the Story Map Journal. And it's one of my favorites. Um, I found that it's a good way, um, the, just the way it's set up and the way that you present information is it really set up well to tell a nice story. So you, you start off with, um, from the left-hand side of the screen here, I've got some text. And you can embed images in there. You can embed um, videos. And then on the right-hand side, it's where um, you can put larger images or you can you know, um, web maps, so your mapping, your, your GIS maps will show up on this side. And this is all configurable. Um, and I'll show you that later. And you could, you could switch these screens so that you could have your text um, over on the right-hand side and the images on the left. So you could have this text window could be floating on top of here. And you have control over how, um, so right now it's, I think I have it set for like 30% of the screen is going to be text and the rest will be uh, images. You can set that to 40% or 50%. It's all configurable. Um, so what you do with these story maps, um, over on the far left-hand side, there's this home button. And then there's these dots that show the different pages within my story map. So if we um, scroll down, um, you, you can see that I've, um, I have this text. And this is our uh, El Nino story map. So we, we put an El Nino story map together uh, for Southern California, for this office in Los Angeles. And then we've had that out there since uh, December. And I've had, I think the last time I looked, it was over 5,000 views or so on this story map so far. And so it's got a bunch of text just about what is, what is El Nino. It's got some, we put some images up there. The images that I have on the left-hand side, I have them set so that you, if you click on them, they'll pop out so that um, people can pop those out and look at those a little closer. Um, and as you scroll down, just lots of information and that we've embedded into the story map. Um, and then as I walk down, you can actually put some links in here. So um, within your text, you can, you can in, uh, have links to other pages that are in there. Um, this is a web map. Um, that shows up now on the right-hand side. And in this web map, I've, I've got an overview map that you can um, set up to include. You can include a legend um, that you can um, open and close. And you can set that to, by default, to either be open or closed as you're building your story map. And then, um, so I've got these points on this map. The web maps themselves are interactive. You can zoom in. You can zoom out. You can, you can pan around on this. Um, but these red dots are my, our traditional GIS file type layer information that we put on the map. And then if you click on one of these dots, you can set it up so that you can enable these pop-ups. So um, when you click on a piece of information that's on your map, you can bring information out. And I've got it set so if I click again, you can see that graph um, larger and pop it out. So it's, there's lots of, lots of things you can do with these story maps. Um, let me 
go on to a different sample. Um, this one is a tabbed um, story map series. And the cool thing about these story maps, you can also embed web pages inside your story map. So in this particular story map, what I was trying to set up was some, a, a daily weather briefing with using a story map. So I've got this set up so that as you go across these tabs, uh, and the idea would be that, um, say, uh, managers or anyone coming into the office, they could use um, this, this briefing story map to get them up to speed uh, on what's going on. And you can embed you know, any kind of web page you want in here. So I have it. It starts off with the uh, NWS um, weather.gov page. So you can see the alert. And, and the web page is, is live. It's active. So you can actually click on this page, um, and, and it would go to that to whatever WFO I just clicked on. So I clicked on Springfield, Missouri. Um, so that's, I've embedded that web page within this story map. So here's a um, forecast page. I've got a page from the satellite, the radar. So um, you know, and as you go across this tab, it's going to show us more information. But um, it's really cool. And, the, and the, the cool thing about this is, like if you're using um, web page links inside of a PowerPoint, when you click those links, it's going to break out. You're going to have to break out your PowerPoint to show stuff. Well, you know, I'm using this story map to um, use as my PowerPoint. So as I'm going through here, if you've noticed, I haven't had to click out of my story map at all. It's all embedded inside the story map. And then also these web pages are embedded inside my story map, um, and they're active. Then I can pan around and zoom and click on different things within my story map. So that's, that's another idea for story maps is to use it as some sort of a you know, briefing tool. Um, and then the other cool thing I think that story maps are, can be used for in the weather service um, is to do some, some damage assessment surveys. So this, we had a, a tornado, um, although out here in California we, we do get tornadoes, but they're, they're generally very weak tornadoes. And this was um, an EF0 that was um, out in our area, out here on January 6, 2016. So I used a story map, and I quickly put together the story map after we're, um, we went out. And actually, I was the one that went out and did the damage survey. And so as I took pictures, um, I was able to save those pictures, and then I built this little story map. So this one's called a story map tour. And it starts off with the first image. I actually put this together. Oops, let me go back here. So this first image, um, let me pop that out. I put that together just with PowerPoint, and then I saved it as an image and put it in here. And I'll give you some more detail on how you get images into story maps as we go through this. Um, and then on each one of these slides, you're able to, to put some uh, text that describes what, what that image is about. And I was able to embed some links in there so that if people wanted some um, information about the um, enhanced Fujita scale, they can click and go get more information on that. Um, and then we took, um, we made a YouTube video of the radar loop, and so I've embedded that in here. So it, I, I, I made the loop and then um, uploaded it to our YouTube channel, and then you use the YouTube um, link to put into your story map. So this is this is playing that YouTube video. Um, I also did that. So that was the radar reflectivity. I did an image um, also with. Um, the, the velocity data from the radar. So and again, if, you, if I pop that out, you can see that you can play this video um, showing the velocity data. So you know, there's lots of flexibility and lots of information that you can put in these. Um, and then as you go through, so I set this one up so that I have, on the left-hand side, I have the, the smaller images show up, and then my maps over here on the right. And again, this, this being this, a web map, it's interactive. I can zoom in and out. I can move around. And then as I go through these numbered pictures here, um, I have them set so that they're on the map. And when you get to that picture on the uh, whatever picture, so I select picture eight, you know, number eight is highlighted there on the map. And then um, you can pop these, these images out so people can see them um, in more detail. So here's another sample. So I think it's, it, I know there's, um, we have a damage assessment toolkit already in the weather service, but I think these story notes could be a nice complement to those damage assessment toolkits. And once you create these, it's a, so it's a web URL, 
that you can share via social media. So you can, you can post them on Facebook or your Twitter account. Um, you can put a link up on your web page. Um, and, and anyone, once these story maps are made public, they're accessible to, to anybody that has that link. And I'll have more detail on how to make those public um, as we go through here again. Um, this was um, another map journal, um, a story map journal that I did, where we had a, a heavy rain event back in December of 2014. So again, I'm telling the, the story of some a weather event that we had. And um, I put this together just in a couple days and was able to get this up on our web page fairly quickly after the event. Um, so it's, again, it's got images, there's lots of text that tells the story of what was going on. And on this first page, again, there was a, I have a video, again, from uh, we made a little YouTube um, video of the radar. And then you, you embed that YouTube um, into the story map. So, so it's, it's really cool how you can put all this information in here and, and tell the story of some sort of weather event. Um, and then I have, again, I have web maps with, with different information. It's got a, a burn area. We had a, this particular event, we had a debris flow at, at a burn area that's actually just down the road from our office. Um, and so I'm telling the story of the heavy rain that led up to that debris flow. And here's another sample using the map journal again. And again, I'm telling, a, I'm looking back at a, a flooding event that we had out here in Southern California back in um, January of 2005. And I'm using a, a story map um, and these web maps to go through and you know, just present the images and present what happened during that flooding event. And here's another sample. Um, this is using a flight map. So we, you can have some information um, with a legend in your story map. And then this, this can, um, you can pop that out of the way. And then you, uh, so on the swipe map, what you're doing is comparing two maps, um, one map versus the second map. So on this particular one, I was doing a, a, a drought monitor comparison from June of 2014 to June 2012. So you can compare those maps. And again, it, 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 it's all interactive. So as you zoom in, um, you, can, you can investigate different areas um, as you zoom in. I've seen these white maps used for um, pre and post storm events. So I've seen it used for tornadoes, where you have a, an aerial image of before the tornado and an aerial image of after the tornado, and you can compare them. I've seen it done um, with hurricane damage, where you can compare and contrast before and after. Um, and this is something that I've been um, playing around with recently. And this is a, a little bit different. I'm actually I brought in, um, I made a little web app where I've, I've brought in some weather data. So I've got the radar data on here. I've got um, some wind bars. I've got the, um, the different hazards that are um, uh, in effect right now. And I've got all these different layers set to update every 10 minutes. So this map will refresh every 10 minutes. And then what I've done is we've created some web maps of some different data. I'm going to zoom in here to the Los Angeles area as a sample. OK, so um, I'm going to click a point on the map here, Los Angeles. So um, by default, I have it set to, um, to do this, this radius of um, information. and. and in this web app, I have it set up so that you can you can increase that that radius that you're looking at, or you can decrease it. But by default, I think I have it set for oh, like 20 miles, maybe 20 mile radius. And so, um, using some web maps um, that are behind the scenes here, so I have it set up. Right now, it's showing me how many um, small airports are in that circle. And then this one is showing major airports. So this, this is um, LAX. And then you can click on this information and get more information about you know, that point that's on the map. Uh, I've got it set up for schools. And the reason we were doing this was, so if we have severe weather, we could zoom in on an area where we're having some severe weather, whether it be wind or hail or, or you know, whatever's going on. And we can identify some, some um, 
different buildings or where people might be and you know where those values are at so that we um, just have an idea of what where we need to focus our efforts. So here's some schools. Here's different hospitals that are um, within that radius. Uh, Major League Baseball Stadium. Um, and then also within this web app, I have it set up so that it's going to pull um, some demographic information. So this is using the 2010 census. So it's showing me within this, from this point, within this radius, um, there's 7.9 million people um, that are in that radius. Uh, then it breaks it down by male and female population, tells me how many housing units are in there. So it's, it's given me some information to help us make some decisions. Um, and then within this app, you can, you can pull in weather. Um, it, unfortunately, it, it wasn't using weather service information, but I think we can set that up to pull in some weather service and from weather information too. This was powered by World Weather Online. But I just wanted to show you um, that there's, you know, you can, you can even do these little web apps like this to help with um, operations. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm done with the samples. Now I'm going to go to you know, how, how you go about creating these story maps. The first thing we need to do is you need to get a NOAA ArcGIS Online account. So I know a lot of you have it. If you don't, that's going to be your first step is um, you're going to have to um, acquire an ArcGIS Online account. Um, within uh, NOAA and the National Weather Service, we have an enterprise license agreement with ESRI that gives us access to um, desktop software and access to ArcGIS Online. So uh, through that enterprise license agreement, if you don't have a, an account, um, it's real simple to you just fill out a form um, and we can get you an account. And I'll show you, you know, where you go to find the link to access um, the form to request an account. Um, once you have an account, then you have access to you know, all these different um, story maps, app, uh, um, apps, and these web maps, and these uh, web, different web apps that are in there that you can start playing with and creating with. So within um, the Weather Service and the NOAA ArcGIS Online, there are some rules of the road that we need to follow. Um, there's a, a governance document that um, the ArcGIS Online team has developed. and uh, I just clicked over to, to the link. Um, so when you go to this document, there's um, a bunch of pages that talk to you about um, generally you know, you know, what's required when we're using this. Um, when we put together story maps, there's just um, some general things that we want to do. Um, we want to have good titles, good descriptions. Uh, there's the use of some tags that you're going to use to help people find them. Um, I'll go through that. Um, so there is a document that gives you lots of information about that. And we can provide that link um, to everyone um, after the webinar so that everyone knows how to find that document. Um, Esri has been really nice. Um, they've created all these different story map templates out there. And then they've set it up so that there's um, some real easy little builders that you, you can access to help you, that walks you through building these story maps. So it makes it really, really easy to put these together. Um, so um, I'll show you a link to, to get to them here in a few slides. But um, there's different templates that you can, you can um, pull in and use as is. If you um, are a coder and you'd say, you know, I'd really like to add this to that, or it'd be neat if it could do this, well, Esri also allows you to download the code, and then you can get into the code and actually make some changes yourself, too. So um, I've, I've all the story maps I've built so far, I've built using their builder, and just um, I've been within their their template, and it's it's all worked out really well for me. Um, and it really with with those builders, so it, it doesn't require you to be a, a programmer at all. It's um, very simple to walk through these and build them. And so they have um, some different you know apps that are out there. Um, let me go to the next page. So um, this is uh, Esri's story map web page where they have the different templates that are available. So the story map tour, I showed you a sample of that. That was my tornado story map that I did. So there was this, did this picture with a web map, and then down below it, you can walk through these different images as like a little, um, a little tour of images. Um, the story map journal, that's one. I showed you several samples of that. I really, really like the journal. It's my favorite one, actually. 
And if you notice next to these, there's this little build button. And when you click the build button, it, it pops up a little um, a little GUI that starts walking you through how to build them. Um, very simple. Uh, the tab layout, I, I showed you a sample of that one. That was my, my weather briefing sample. Um, this story map series, this bullet layout, that's actually the, the story map template that I'm using to give this presentation. So if you notice, there's um, these little dots across the top. So that's this template with, with information inside of it. So um, that's another really, really nice one to use. I showed you a sample of this flight map. So the, again, they're all, you know, there's a build button right next to it. So as we set it up so that it's very simple to, um, to go ahead and, and build these. And then of course, if you want to um, customize them, you can download the code and, and customize them yourself, too. All available on um, Esri's story map webpage um, under the app tab. OK, so here's a little, little quick screenshot of, the, of a map journal editing GUI. So it's, it just, it's a little GUI that, that pops up. You just fill in um, some information about the title, um, the content that you want to add, you can add maps, images, videos, or a web page. And it just gives you a little bit of um, configuration. So they're, they're very simple little GUIs and um, setup menus. So adding images, that's always been one of the questions that people ask is, um, you know, how do you add your images? How do you get your images in there? Um, images, they've every set it up so that you can bring in images um, if you have a Flickr account, you can even bring them in from a Facebook account. So I've actually put some images on our office Facebook page and been able to bring them in from there. You can bring them in through a Picasso account, or you can um, use a URL. So the way I've done images, the majority of what I've done is using a URL. I have, um, we, we, I worked with my uh, webmaster here in our office and our ITO. And we have a, a directory on our network that when we drop um, uh, different images into this uh, network directory. It's our synced up to uh, the regional web server. So for, for my region out here in the west, that's in Salt Lake City. And so it, it automatically, when I drop them in there, the script runs every five minutes, copies those images up to the web server. And once they're on the web server, I can use this URL option to each one of my images. Um, so if anyone you know after afterwards has any more um, question about that, I can give you some more detail, but that's, that's what I do. And then um, videos, um, you can bring in, you know, I've showed you some samples. I've put together several YouTube videos, and then um, once I upload those to our office YouTube account, then you just have this, this link that you, to that video that you can put in and bring it into your, into your story map. So point of configuration, once you put your story map together, um, you want to go through and do some, um, some metadata. You want to have uh, a good title, you want to have a nice description, um, you want to have a nice thumbnail, so this little image, you can, you can take a little image and put in there as a thumbnail, and you want to have appropriate tags. And the reason you want to have all this information is um, people, um, that's how they're going to search for your story map. So they'll search for it by tags. So there's a little um, place down here where you fill in a bunch of tags, so you can put story map, or NOAA, National Weather Service, flooding, tornado, you know, whatever that is about. You want to have these keywords that people can, can find your story map by. And then uh, I'm going to show you how to do some searches and then show you how, why it's important to have good thumbnails and descriptions and tags. Um, but so, so that's the, uh, before you're done with it, you want to make sure you have that all filled in and have it, um, you know, good, good uh, images that people are going to attract people's eyes. Um, and then so once you get your story map created, in the weather service we have a procedure where there's um, a few, a handful of people that are a ArcGIS online administrators for the weather service. And so one, if, if someone needs to request an account, then um, it's one of those National Weather Service admins that is going to uh, respond to that and set up that account. And then two, when you put together some content um, within your, your NOAA ArcGIS Online um, account, you can, you can make your content viewable by um, the organization. So anyone that's within the NOAA um, ArcGIS Online can see it, but you can't 
with your user level that we have to set for you, you're not able to um, make that public so that anyone in the world can see it. So what we set up is a procedure where um, once you get your content together, you'll fill out a form and you'll say, hey, I've got content. Um, I need one of the Weather Service um, ArcGIS Online admins to review it. And um, myself and Jack Selemeyer are two of the admins, and there's several, there's a couple others. And we'll review your content, just to, um, and we're going to be reviewing it. I guess, I sh again, I, sh I had mentioned earlier this uh, best practices document. So there's a lot of information in here on the best practices document about what, what should be included in your story map. Um, and then we're going to, again, we're going to look at, um, you know, just look through it for spelling, make sure there's good thumbnail, good titles, you know, all, all those things that um, need to be there are there. Um, we'll do that. And once, once we um, uh, approve it, then we're going to make that public, and then that link will be available to, you know, anyone in the world. So I wanted to uh, real quickly show you um, if you're interested in story maps and you want to, and you haven't worked with them, um, there's a couple ways where you can, you know, look at story maps that other people have put together and for some um, ideas and some inspiration. Um, one of them is in every on their story map page they have a gallery, and the gallery is not all the story maps that have been created, but it's a it's a subset of the story maps. So they've got some of the um, what they've feel are some of the, the better samples of story maps. So you can look through their gallery, and then you can search through their gallery. So if you were to search for um, something like NOAA, um, with these, this is only searching for story maps within their gallery that use the NOAA tag. So you can go through here, and, and you can find um, some of these different story maps in them. And then you can click on those and look through those and get some inspiration um, that way. Now, Beyond, oh, and then I'm gonna, um, I want to do one more thing on this gallery page. If you put together a story map and you would like to see it included in Esri's gallery, um, on this gallery page, there's a submit your app button. You can actually uh, submit your story map for uh, consideration for inclusion in this gallery by Esri. So they'll review it, um, generally give you some feedback on it, and, and if they like it, then they'll include it in the gallery. So beyond the gallery, if you want to look for story maps and get some inspiration, you can go to um, arcgis.com, um, which is this page, and then there's a search feature up here on the top. And this one's going to search not just their gallery, but it's going to search all the story maps that are out there. So uh, what you'd want to do is you can put in a little search like story map um, flooding. And so with that search, I'm going to be searching through all the story maps looking for any story map that used um, the tag flooding. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's see how quick our internet is here today. Okay, so it, so that search that I just did came up with 708 um, story maps and web maps that used the tag flooding. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out, I had mentioned that you want to have a good title, a good description. Um, you want to have uh, good tags, and you want to have a good thumbnail. This is why. So I just did that search, and then it brought up um, in these different pages here. And let me get to another page here. I wanted to find one that didn't have a thumbnail just to show you. Um, well, so here's one. So this particular one that says, um, the, the Gimpy flood. See, the, the owner of this one didn't put a thumbnail, so it just pulled, shows up with this uh, generic image here. Um, so as people are scrolling through, I think good, good thumbnails and good images are going to draw people's attention. And then good descriptions are going to um, you know, bring your eye to those different story maps. But if you don't include a thumbnail, you're going to have this image right here. And then the tags are important, too, because you know, as you saw, I did the story map flooding. I could do story map tornado or story map NWS. So those tags that you use are going to help people find your story map. So you want to include um, some good good tags and, and as many as you think that are going to be relevant to your story map. Include those in it so people can find it. Um, getting started with story maps, as we on their story map web page. They have lots of information 
um, where you can, you know, again, find different samples of story maps. Um, it, it helps you get started with story maps. They've got um, some information on learning how to make story maps. Um, they've got principles of effective storytelling. So they've got lots of information on their web page that um, can help you get started and help you know, guide you down the path of um, building story maps. And here's my contact information. So that's all I had. Um, I don't know if Jack wants to take questions now or maybe hold them to the end. But that's um, all I had for yeah. my presentation. Thank you, Jamie. Let's go ahead and yeah, take a few minutes to do some questions. Hey, Jamie, this is Nick and Black. Hey, uh, just out of curiosity about how long did it take you I know the El Nino presentation there was pretty in-depth, but how long did it take uh, you to put that together? But uh, definitely more interested in how long it took you to put the storm survey uh, example together. Yeah, so the more detail you put in them, the, the longer it's going to take you to do it. The, the El Nino one, um, there was uh, myself and one of our interns in the office worked on that one. And I'd say that El Nino one, the, the bulk of the material, probably took us, uh, you know, maybe a week to put that one together. Um, the one I did on the tornado survey, because I was the one I did, I went out and did this, the field survey and took the pictures and came back, and um, I was able to actually build that one um, in a day. Now, the, the key is you have to have your images um, set up. So I was able to just drop them into our network directory, they get synced up to the web server, and then I have access, then it, now it's a URL that I can access those images. So once you have all the, that background stuff set up, I mean, you, these can go together you know, fairly quickly. And then I had that one up, so I put it together a day, and um, you know, then I had it up on our web page, um, you know, two days after the tornado, I had, um, it was on our social media, so, you know, they, they they can go, go together really quickly. And one of the things I, would, I didn't mention um, that I'm just thinking about now, there is a, for that story map tour, so that's the one I used for the tornado, there's also a, a, a little web app or an app that you can use on your iPhone called snap to map snap S-N-A-P, and then the uh, number two, and then map, M-A-P, snap to map And that one allows you, you can actually create a little story map tour just using your, your iPhone or your iPad, um, and I've done a, a three-slide or a three-image um, story map tour just walking around the office taking pictures, and I built it on my phone in five minutes. So, and then you can you also have you, the ability to put in some text, a, a little description about each image. So you can actually build these those story map tours out in the field too if you wanted, um, and build them uh, on the fly. Yeah, this is Jack. Okay. I was going to say, I'll add in, too, that uh, these story maps are wonderful and that they are, they're pretty out-of-the-box enabled for your mobile devices once they're created. So you can see them on a, on, a, on a PC or you can see them on your mobile device, and they look pretty good by default without additional configuration. Just a, a follow-up, if I could, uh, this is JJ. Um, uh, Jamie or, or Jack or anybody, uh, uh, regarding the question about how long it takes to produce one of these, is it possible to maybe set up some like templates where you could uh, uh, have something pretty consistent and it's just wh however the, the uh, information changes, it dynamically updates in the story map, is that possible? I'll let Jack take that one, I know he's been working on some templates and... Yeah, there's, we're going to need some assistance I think from Esri on that in terms of and able to uh, sort of have a template sitting there that you can populate. And so it, you can do it with portions of it, certainly the web map that's underlying your story map. But once you go to the to making an app, which is, which is what a story map is, it's not so simple. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jamie, this is Mark. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering uh, if there's a way to make these story maps a little more private. Say, if you wanted to use those, use them internally as like kind of a an HSM. Yeah. So, Mark, there's um, when you get your uh, ArcGIS Online account, your through NOAA, um, you have the ability as as the user level that that each one of you has. You can set it so that it's just viewable through the organization. 
Um, and that only people, the only people that are going to be able to see it are people that are part of the, the NOAA ArcGIS Online organization. No one that um, is not within that group would be able to see it. Um, once, if you make that, if Jack or myself, if we review it and make that a public URL, if we set it to public, then that URL, if somebody finds it or gets that URL, it's public, it's available to anybody out there. But, so we couldn't set it just to an organizational level um, on the sharing part. Okay, thanks. But anybody that wanted to look at that inside NOAA, when it's set to NOAA, they have to have an account. Correct. I've got a question with the approval process. If, if we create a story map, it's, it's put out there on the web, and let's say we've got a, a significant update to it, does it have to go through again an approval process, or is it just kind of on the honor system there? Well, this kind of goes at uh, an idea I have here that we may get to is, is how to handle this. But we, do, we do want to make templates that are sort of pre-approved so, so that any relatively small content changes you make within there should be fine. So we, we, can, we can work on that. Okay, thank you. Now, what's the uh, the time between the, the when the story map is submitted and when it's approved? About how long does that take? Uh, there's four it's, people um, that are admins on there for the weather service, and it typically is it depends on whether or not they're in town and all that. But uh, it's usually within a day or two. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Barry and Brownsville. Hey. Great talk. Hello? Uh, great talk. I want to follow up or, or piggyback on that idea. Um, I see the future of this going into like a blog methodology, and I almost could see that admins can be one per office so that you could actually have approval and quick turnaround to broadcast a story map, a quick story like a survey as a breaking news item versus the longer few stuff, which may take a week to create, and it would be fine to have a, a higher level admin. So what are your thoughts on the future of, of having, say, one admin per office uh, who is kind of able to approve it on the fly? Yeah, Barry, this is Jack. It's, it's exactly what we're thinking about doing. It's a matter of how to set it up. Do, do we pre-set up accounts that do this? And do we pre-set population of, of certain maps? And so it's, it's a logistical item that in an organization item for the, for the material, but it certainly can be doing. I think we could really do a great job with that. Okay, thanks. Jack, uh, I have a question about you know setting up accounts. Does each individual need to go in and set up an account to create a story map, or can we have one like for an office? Uh, both. You can do either way. A lot of people have office accounts, so it's it's your choice. And that was again one of the ways we could jump out is go ahead and pre-make office accounts and. But it, you know, it takes some thought about how, what's the best way to do that. But either way, send your submission in. Hey, Jack. Yeah. This is Pam at, um, in Kansas City. I know we had chatted, I don't know, it's been a while now, about those pre-approved um, templates, because we really wanted to use this for damage surveys. But unless you get it out you know, the next day, you know, everybody's doesn't care anymore. Um, where has that gone? I haven't heard anything come across for a while since we were discussing that. Well, it's, it's a matter of you know how much we need to baseline this as a function, but if you have a web map of something you've made or someone else has made, you swapping out the information in that web map, which would be the underpinnings of a story map, would then be live all the time. So again, if, if we think and if we communicate that, and again, this is just a, a first dab into this, we could set up templates that each office could have, and then they can just maintain them. And so they could have, as soon as they get the information and update their web map, it will be out there through that interface. Okay. If you, if you all don't mind, I was going to move on with the rest of our material here, and we can follow up down the road. We're most likely going to have to have another session. I screwed up and uh, used the wrong webinar, so it only took 101 people. So about 30-some people were shut out, and I apologize for that. They may be on the phone here but not seeing the webinar. So we can repeat this. There will be a recording of us all. Um, but let's uh, move into this other session here. And we can go longer, I think, unless by chance it cuts us off. But I wanted to show – I'm going to move the mic here and show a few more visuals here. Sort of different entry points as well. They may be, and they probably are, most definitely surpassed by 
uh, what Jamie has shown in terms of the richer experience you get with a story map. But uh, I wanted to walk through them anyway. One of them is simply the underlying web maps that you use. And again, I've, these, this will all be linked. So this is what a web map looks like, and, and you'll experience this if you haven't already when you have an account. So you, you have a map, and in this case, I'm feeding it with some underlying uh, comma-separated value data. And inside that, that, that uh, file is simply a bunch of uh, attribute information, real simple, real light. And I pass this through up to the web servers that we have here using a uh, network link that automatically R syncs to the web. And most of our offices have some function like this to feed our web pages. Um, and so this file sits out there, and it's displayed, and it's displaying uh, CF6 information, climatic uh, daily uh, mean values that are coming from your, your office's CF6 product. And so it, it's displaying, uh, in this case, precipitation anomalies for the current month uh, for February. You can see you, so you can see how wet it's been over in the uh, South Carolina area and how dry it's been anomalously in February so far for the northern portions of uh, California. So that's a web map. So, and here's another one that has uh, the temperature anomalies for, for February so far. We're only 10 days in. And this is all going to change in the northeast here with the colder air. But my point is, even just simply using a web map, there is a mode, uh, when you look at a web map, up here in the top right, if I were logged in, and I'll show you this here shortly, there is a edit presentation or a make presentation button that will reveal itself. And you can go ahead and make a presentation that walks through your web map and turns on and off layers, uh, and it has titling. And so you can see this is what it would produce here. And if I hit reload on this page, you'll see that uh, each slide that I've created, they're basically like a present, it's a presentation, like a PowerPoint, has a title, and it changes here at a certain increment, in this case, every five seconds. And then you can change the zoom and if any pop-ups you want to show or any of the layers you want to show in your map. And so this one's taking a look back at January and the anomalous uh, rainfall that we had in January across Florida and also California, and then highlighting certain stations. So this is a very, just one example. Again, it's, this can also be created in a web, inside of a story map, but you can do something very similar just using a web map, which is really light as a sort of a way of getting in there and uh, starting off with something small. So I wanted to show that to you as an example. Another one is uh, looking at a different map here. This is, this is showing a number of layers that this one does not loop. And so it's showing you rainfall with water year to date, three slides of that, three slides of uh, the rainfall anomaly, you know, colorizing uh, the dots by the rainfall anomaly. So we can see since the, you know, since October 1st, we've had an extremely wet experience here in North Texas down in uh, Corsicana where they've had over 22 inches of rainfall above and beyond what they normally do during this water year which starts in October 1st. So you can display information that way. So you can have people walk through this. And the other wonderful thing here is that this each of these slides, when you have them, this one has 12 slides, each slide has its own URL simply by adding the right uh, information on the end of this and it'll go right to that slide number and so you can use this and you can share this in your social media links to a map that you have configured to convey whatever information you want to convey on a regular basis and so you can regularly communicate this and change the information underneath as you wish or it can be fed by information that changes on its own as is the case here so there's different ways. This is very extremely powerful because you have once you have your web map approved and uh, it's linked and open, then you, it's a great conduit to communicate through. And then you can embed, and, and Jamie showed some of this before, you can embed links to uh, URLs within your pop-ups or other material. In this case, I'm pointing at Austin, and I happen to link back to a, uh, an El Nino tracking uh, 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 website here that's set up to show you the uh, Haywood plot for Austin which is comparing the normal rainfall with uh, different El Nino year rainfall. So you can see where you are on the chart. And so that's another powerful feature is, is embedding those URLs within your simple CSV data in this case. So the next thing I wanted to cover was uh, ArcGIS Online, or sorry, ArcGIS Online Assistant is what's shown on the page here. Um, and you, you can log in here and all of your material shows up on the left hand side. Let me show my content here and get rid of this search. 
So all my folders in my ArcGIS Online account are shown here and how I've organized them. And you can search through here to find something. And what this allows you to do is, this is, is it's known as the Swiss Army Knife. It allows you to go in here to, to either see your content or, or, and or edit it. In this case, I want to uh, just simply search for that. And so I've got a, a web map that I set up. And let me show you what the web map looks like. It's this. It's called New Anomaly, December 25th. And what this map was showing was all the warm uh, temperatures across the east that we had at the end of December. So you can walk through this map and turn on different days and look at how many record lows were set. All these number ones are ranks, rank of number one means a record was set for those locations. So we had tons of those days. There's Christmas Eve here, Christmas morning, lots of records set across. So that was the point of this web map is to have all that information in there. And I said, well, that's great. I'm looking back at a past event in an almostly warm week. I want to make that into something that has some live data to it. So what I wanted to do was go to ArcGIS Online, and you can do this relatively simply, is I can do the update URLs for services in a map by clicking on my map. And so here's all the links to the underlying CSV data that I have feeding that map that I just showed you. And it's in reverse date order here. So you've got the whole month anomaly is down here at the bottom and then you walk up through the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, all the different days in that map. But I want to change these because maybe I've got new information for January now. Or in w in w what I did here was to point to new data that I have that has information per day of minimum temperatures that is on a, a rolling seven-day period. So I've made new CSV files, and I think I show them here on the back end of this web map. And you can see the links. You probably can't see them. But there's one that says min one day ago, min two days ago, min three days ago. So using ArcGIS Online Assistant, I can, sit, I can quickly change these values to that new um, URL string of that new data, hit save, and this map that I have has been updated with new, or new URLs, and so it would show that new information. And in a perfect world, you would make a copy of this first and then alter your copy. And that's how you can proliferate information based on a prior example of something successful you created. In this case, a very basic web map, but one that has a lot of information in it. And so the resultant map, if I didn't delete it here, is this, this is uh, what we're looking at. The min temperatures two days ago. Uh, there were some near record uh, values out there in Southern California. You can click on them to see the data in here. So very warm anomalous lows that happened back in that. So this map is now ready to go and can loop through that information uh, in a map, much like this, uh, this one can. And I believe I can show you an example of how that can be looped. So that's uh, sort of a, a, a light cut into what ArcGIS Online or sorry, the ArcGIS Online Assistant can do for you. The other option in here is to view the JSON for a, and the JSON is the underlying guts of what these story maps are built on. It's very perhaps disturbing to look at. It's, it's obviously computer code, but it is relatively simple, and it's uh, human readable here. And so you can use this option to go into your, J to see what's behind one of your, whether it's a web map or it's a story map, and you can make slight alterations to to alter how you're displaying content, whether you've got things classified by different value ranges or whether you want to go in here and change one of these links right in here, you can do the same thing. It's a, it's a different method of updating what's in your, config, it's a configuration file basically for your web map. So it's another powerful way, once you take a look at it, of how you can quickly sort of proliferate information and make edits and we can grow capacity across the weather service in terms of making use of this technology. So I wanted to just skim in there very lightly to show you what uh, some of the tools that are out there that we can use. And then the last thing I wanted to show, this goes back to some of the discussions and questions we had earlier, is, is just a, an example of, a, again, a web map journal, or sorry, a story map journal, like Jamie had described, of how it can be created. But it can, what you can do in these journals, obviously, whether you have buttons here on the right, or whether you have buttons with numbers across the top, there's different configuration choices. But you can embed, obviously, nested information in here. So what I've done in this example, just as an example of grabbing a number of different uh, story maps out there across the Weather Service to share with you of how this information can be displayed. So here's the opening screen 
uh, for better or for worse, showing the temperature anomalies for, for February so far this month. Here's one where I've sort of dumped a number of my examples in here about a look at uh, different, uh, whether they be presentation mode. Here's that one that's going to walk through slides. And you can bury that in here, and you can point your users straight to this interface or to this particular tab or this particular web map. So you can see how that we can create content and then as you work on the back end of what's behind these web maps or story maps, you can have live content that there, that's there at the ready. And here's an example of, those, uh, of these last seven days of min temperatures uh, once it loads up. And this simply walks through again the last seven days over time and whether or not there was any record lows in those last couple days. So back on the 9th, there was a record low up there in Montana. So, so there's a ton of content you can have in these embedded story maps. And this is where we'll have to have the future discussions about how to organize our activity. You could imagine each of these tabs, whether inside of this map series or whether down the right-hand side, is a, uh, a portal, so to speak, for each forecast office, each national center, any entity in the Weather Service and NOAA could have an opening point here. And so this simply points to Jamie's El Nino story map. And then he can guide what he can govern whatever is within there for his particular office and have that as a conduit. Similarly, the Florida office in Tampa created their story map on El Nino. A lot of the same content, a lot of opportunities to share the underlying material. Um, but they have a, an opening here to put content out there through their office. Ditto for St. Louis. They've got other examples here. This is uh, describing their, their flooding from back in late December. And then FEMA has, has adopted this technology as well to uh, put together a journal of, of things that they commonly look at to support their operations. So you can see several of our partners that we deal with on a regular basis in our IDSS world and Weather Ready Nation efforts are using this technology as well. And then there's, again, I could go on and on. There's tons of examples, and this is open to you to check out. That's, it's kind of a demo uh, place. It's not anywhere near as documented as well as it should be if this was a formal offering, but it's, it's a conduit to share with you what these uh, examples could be and how you could use them in your office. So that's really how I wanted to close out what, with what we have here and how you can point to different information. Uh, lastly, all the content that we used here today was put into a, a story map, into a Google Drive space here. Our uh, agenda is on top. And we thought that one way to possibly grow is to have a frequently asked questions area where you could go ahead in and take a look at uh, and post your questions that you might have had, someone has already posted it, uh, of questions you had on today's webinar that we can follow up on and try to build some organization of how to communicate and grow capacity. And so that's there for you to, to use. And hopefully if you don't have those links, we can get them to you. Similarly, uh, there are other entities in NOAA, the Office of Coast Management, OCM, has put out a standard operating procedure of how to go ahead and run um, a story map up through their decision tree, as, as Jamie described earlier, in terms of approval processes, uh, best practices, make sure you do this, make sure you do that, etc. So I put in copies of that into our workspace here, and ideally we can have a, a, a subset of folks that can help maintain and grow that. And similarly, best practices is another document that, uh, that other entities have put together that uh, we can build and grow upon. So really, that's all I had. Uh, we can take questions. It's at the bottom of the hour that we had. And I'm, I apologize again for cutting off at least 30-some people out there, but this recording will be made available if you don't have a link to it. In fact, I'll probably, size-wise, I'll put it in here. Um, so thank you for attending. Both Jamie and I thank you, and uh, we can do this again at any time down the road. If anybody wants to stay on for questions, we can do that for a little while. Thank you all. Hi. I'm can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. I'm going to be sending out an e email to the attendees with these links. I can do that. Uh, if you don't get one, depending on how you heard about this, do you have my email or Jamie's? I went through the, the registration process, the usual one. OK. Um, yeah, let me, what's your name? <laughs> One I can give you mine, it's just ron.murphy at Noah. Okay, all right, Ron, I'll make sure I get you that. 
Okay, thank you. I'll probably put something out on the forum for those that uh, weren't on the calendar invite. They can just get the material from the forum. Okay. Yeah, Jack can I'll forward it along in other regions as well. Yeah. No yep. Yeah, I'll forward it to the, the whole group there. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any, well, any other? Frank Bell, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure, Frank. This is a very open-ended question. What, what have you looked at with the possibility of using this for mobile applications? Uh, well, yeah, there's there's templates for, for configuring mobile applications in the uh, in the universe there of what Esri has. And again, a lot of these work pretty nicely on your mobile device, but they have templates that are designed specifically for spe very specific devices. So that there's a conduit there that you can already explore once you get an account and get on there. And it's simply like Jamie was showing you. You click on one of the tabs that says, you know, I want to make an app. And then you get a choice of what kind of device do you want to make an app for? And how do you want it to lay out? And it's pretty straightforward. So, yeah, I can work with you, Frank, or however you need guidance. Well, we're just wondering, you know, about because of our current restrictions on developing mobile apps, if this is a, a way to bridge that gap, maybe. And I'm also wondering if there are any examples, any examples out there that you could uh, point us to. Uh, I don't at the, at, the, at the ready right now, but uh, maybe someone else on the line does. We've had some Esri folks that were joining us. Um, we, we can find you some. But you're right, there's there's rules of the road that we need to adhere to, and obviously there's boundaries that we cannot cross. But certainly the potential is there to do things, which is why there are hey, rules Jack. of the road. Yeah, go ahead. This is Adam down at West. So just a quick question. Is there a plan to, uh, with the weather service, to implement uh, more than just the story maps? Is there anything else coming up at the federal GIS conference uh, down the road? Is there a presentation that you're going to do uh, in more detail? I, I found this very informative. I just was wondering if there's another presentation that is coming uh, about any future developments on the story map idea. Yeah, it's constantly evolving, and I, I can't speak for what Esri is going to have. It there's so there is presentations. There's going to be a ton of them at the Fed user conference there in February in D.C. Um, I try my best to keep up with what they have, but um, yeah, I, we just have to keep in touch. There, does anybody else want to take that? It, Jack, this is Jeff Donnelly. Yes, Jeff from Esri. Um, uh, yeah, there are a couple of sessions um, that the story map team, and I'm not sure if Rupert, Rupert is still on from, from our um, story map team, but there are a couple of uh, sort of instructional um, sessions at the Federal GIS Conference. One of them actually includes your uh, environmental visualization group um, presenting on some work that they've done with, uh, with their communications office um, and some work they've done, which we quickly like to show some examples. Uh, but we'd also be very, um, you know, pleased to do specific, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, like a one-hour type of book or uh, how to, if you'd like, for the service. Uh, you know, just let us know, and we'd be happy to set something up. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of good information online to check out as well. So. Please peruse the, the numerous links we have. One thing I didn't show was at the bottom of our agenda. Ezra just gave a great story map uh, presentation last Friday that I put the information here with a number of links, number of examples, that uh, there's plenty of follow-up material there, too. But, yeah, we need to have more of these kind of uh, uh, informational sharing sessions about what is possible. Right. I guess adding uh, to what I, uh, your question uh, from Key West was, yeah, Adam. You know where the future directions are. We'd be again in that sort of presentation. Be happy to talk about some things we're working on or ideas you might have that we could uh, also consider. Well, great, Jeff. Uh, Jack, Thanks, Jack. Jack. This is Rupert from the ESRI Story Maps team. Yes, Rupert. Very good presentation. Jim did a great job. That that was very impressive. Just wanted to go back to a couple of things. One was a question about. Um, using other templates available to make it easier to make story maps and definitely keep in touch with us about your requirements for that because that's something we're actively looking at 
with story maps. Um, we're looking at patterns by which it's e we can make it easier for people to create them. Because there's some story maps where you want to do editorial editing, where you're writing text. But there's also some story maps where you just want to pour data and maps into a prepared template. So we're still trying to gather information from the user base, what sort of template templateization will work best for them. So have a think about that because it's something we're definitely interested in doing. For example, um, you could we could enable people to set up a group in ArcGIS Online, put web maps in there, and then we could automatically generate a story map from all the web maps in that group and display all the descriptive text next to the map. So things like that we're very interested in um, learning what um, good patterns would be. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I think that would be wonderful, and I'm sure we, uh, the folks on this uh, webinar will have plenty of ideas, so we'll have to follow up with another session. Thanks What's for that, Richard. Um, I, me and Jack, we should follow up with you and um, continue to move that, that idea and effort forward. Yeah. Hey, Jack, this is Jan in Seattle. I have a, a relatively easy question. When you built your, your applications, did you do any download of the web app builder and host it locally, or is this all done from AGOL? Uh, I've explored both that where I've downloaded it to go ahead and make the additional tweaks that maybe I wanted to do, some of the default settings that weren't there. But most of the time, I, yeah, it, it takes effort to do that, and, I, and I'm just, I don't have the time to go into the entire universe of it all, but I have tried both. Because, I mean, what I'm running into is we're in the ocean, and I was on the tab story map, and when you hit the pop-up, you configure the pop-up. I couldn't figure out any way to get rid of get directions. They have zoom to area on the bottom of the pop-up window and get directions. Well, the get directions is irrelevant for the ocean, and I couldn't figure out how to remove that. Uh, well, I know there's book, bookmarks. I'm not sure if they pass through. But... Sorry, go ahead. I was, as Jeff, I was just suggesting to Jan's question, maybe Rupert has a, a comment. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very good point. On some of the maps or apps you can embed in story maps, you might see um, get directions, and it, it's a good point. I've made a note of that. They're not, it's not there. If you make a web map in ArcGIS Online and include it in a story map, you won't see that in the pop-up because we do hide it. But... Um, you might see that in other um, apps or pages that you embed inside a story map. That is a good point. So I just did a, so I made a tab story map, and I used two different REST services off my ArcGIS server, and then made the master map using those services. So they had three tabs, one with everything and one for each one. And when I configure the pop-up, which is just telling what labels and images and that type of stuff you want to pop up, when it pops up, no matter what, I get, you know, um, the two comments on the bottom, zoom to area and get directions. And I couldn't figure out how to remove get directions. Is that a technical support question? Well, he... <coughs> Well, you go um, 10 nautical miles east, and then you take a right at Georgia Bank, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah boat. The second question I had is I was thinking about the web app builder, and to get to the code, you have to make it public. And I was kind of in a, in a dilemma because I wasn't ready to make my application public because I'm developing it, but to, to get to the code, I couldn't figure out how to get to the code without making it public. So I thought maybe I was missing something there. Yeah, for the, for the first thing about the um, the driving directions, could you, is it possible to get a link to Jamie or Jack that they could share with me to see that? Because Do you have it on your screen, Jan? What? Do you have it on your screen and I give you control? Um, Hold on, I might. Let me just see if I've got... Uh, I killed it, but I could put it up on my screen. 
Well, you can send, so well, you can send it offline. It I'd just be interested in seeing that because because um, you shouldn't be seeing the driving directions inside a sort of vanilla story map, but you might see it depending on how you've embedded maps in there. But I would be interested to see that either oh, way oh. because yeah, um, so you should be able to see it. Oh, shoot. You know what I did was that I killed my, I guess I could log back on. I killed my... But, um, yeah, maybe we can um, have you send a, if you want, just send me a note and I can and I can uh, copy in Rupert so we can kind of take this follow up on this. Yeah, I mean, is there a way for, for me to be able to share this with you so that you can see what I've already put up? Because the other part I've got to do is because it's coming off of my server, I've got to... Um, make you a user or give you somehow get, I guess I need to do a screen share. That's the bottom line. I think if you send it to a link the link to me, we can get Rupert online with you. Okay. Also the thing with the the thing with the code download is that these are all this is all cloud based mapping and app creation. You don't need to download the code for one of the apps and host it yourself unless you've got a specific major tweak you want to do to the look or the functionality. Or if you, for example, some people do a code download because they they want the, the, the web domain to be on their own website. For example, a commercial, a commercial company might want its story map not to have ArcGIS.com in its domain. But in general, you shouldn't have to worry about downloading anything, but then you might be a developer who wants to cha change the code. But I wanted to make that clearer that um, when you said you were downloading some of the code, I, it, I wanted to check if you if you really need to do that. Part of the, the there was two reasons for, for wanting to download. The one reason was that I was dealing with having the directions on the bottom that I was trying to avoid. Um, and so then I was thinking that I might have more control doing that. The other thing is is that I had been able to, um, in the past, we had done one before and we downloaded the code. And what that gave us was the ability to stick in our logos where we wanted to make the font mix, make match our web pages. And so it just gave nice, more yeah. control. Yeah, that is the sort of thing we, we would do a download. Perhaps we could do a follow-up about that or do a separate call later to any issues with that, because I would like to help with that. Yeah, and related... I don't want to take up too much time, actually. What do you want to wrap up? Related to that, Rupert, too, I know one of the main reasons, yeah, we're, we're apparently not allowed to point to .com, so pointing to your cloud space, it, it would be nice if I can build something there and then immediately download it and just host it on one of our .gov links. But, and I don't know how easy it would be to pull it out, so to speak, once it's been fully touched up in your space. It seems like if it's in our space, then it should be easy to link to it because it's all public and stuff. Yeah, we can we can follow up on that again. It's just can we can we point to our own NOAA Geo platform from our web pages? It always comes up in the weather service, and some say yes, some say no. Well, if you need us to help you dig into it at all, I mean, I mean, you imagine you're talking to Randy and all those folks um, related to the administration of the, the geo platform, right? Yeah, it, at times, but it, you know, once you get into this story map area, it's like, a, I, I, I want to make a link and I want to embed things, and then it becomes other parts of NOAA can do it. We necessarily sometimes can't, so there's there's nuances there. But I know your number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any any other questions for any folks out there? Yeah. Hi. This is. Will anybody, will anybody be at the GIS conference? Is the federal conference? I plan on being at at that uh, on my own time. I'm just curious if anybody's going to be there. Uh, there's a number of NOAA folks that will be there in DC. Okay. Good. Sounds good. Yeah. Who's that speaking? I can the get you. There's also a story maps booth yeah. at the Fed GIS conference. Yeah, are you about the snap to map app? Sorry. Um, I tried to go and down. I downloaded the snap to map app, and um, 
I tried to log in, and I do have a, I have access to the online, um, I have access through NOAA. So when I logged in, it said that I had to have admin or publisher um, rights before I could use the Snap to Map. Do you guys know anything about that? That's correct, yeah. Um, it's not so much, not a, it's not a fully supported official app. There was sort of a proof of concept that was that was created. But it, it does require that um, as an ArcGIS Online user, you've got permissions on your account to be able to publish services. Because okay. when you take, so we because it uses a service, the images that you take with your, to host the images that you take with your phone. So we can give you, yeah, through NOAA, we can give you publisher rights. We can't make you an admin. So if it's just publisher, you know, what, what's your name? And I can make sure your account can do that so you can try it out. Oh, that would be great. Uh, my name is Brittany Whitehead. Okay, Brittany. And the account's under your name? Very much. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll make you a publisher and see if that helps it out. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, that you need that right on Snap to Map. I didn't realize that because um, I'm an admin, so I didn't realize I, I had the extra rights there. All righty, we ready to close this out? And I'm thinking we need to do this again. You know, maybe in, in two weeks. Jack. Yeah. Jack, this is Paul McKee at West Gulf. Yes, Paul. I have a question. Go ahead. And just questions that we've had uh, over the months really is, is in the has to do with trying to rework the E19, so to speak, something that we've kind of been calling graphical E19. And the, the story map seems to have maybe a maybe the perfect application for 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 looking at that, taking a look at how we you know how we can better bring the E19 information into uh, you know, into the public realm. Do you know of anybody that is, that has taken a look at that at all? I wouldn't be surprised if Jeff does through their their hydro folks. You know that you know you have to describe what the E19 is exactly, but I wouldn't be surprised that they've come through that data already. Uh, well, yeah, I'm sorry. The, the E19 in the hydro world is essentially just. The, the complete informational document that kind of tries to tie uh, impacts to river flood forecasts uh, in terms of what what are the impacts going to be uh, at associated levels uh, within the river at a particular location. So, well, this is Jamie. I I haven't put the E19 information in there, but what I have done is all of our river forecast points for the Los Angeles and the San Diego office. I put together a story map tour where I have them. Um, I have a picture of the, the the gauge itself and an upstream and a downstream shot. And then I could essentially take that story map and, and add in some more of that information from the E19 and turn it into a graphical E19. So I think it's certainly doable. Uh, we would just need to get some some support and uh, some traction on it. Okay, that may be something we'll, we'll talk more here in the office, but something I think we'd like to explore. Um, and maybe even within, you know, there may be even regional support to, to do that as a pilot or something. But, uh, I think it'd be a neat, neat thing to do. Uh, Chris Lander here was also mentioning, uh, I guess, an Esri application that could be used. I think it maybe it's called Collector, where then it would allow, say, the service hydrologist out in the field or anyone, for that matter, out in the field to to take pictures and they're georeferenced and be able to push them up to a to you know a a, a story map essentially or you know an art yeah it's online you know map that's published. That so I have, this is Jamie. I have collector on my phone as well as the snap to map. Um, Jack and I after the the Esri conference in San Diego last July we were playing around with Collector. Um, uh, actually, while we were at the conference and then after the conference, we were giving it a test and uh, taking pictures and actually adding some text in there and uploading them. And um, we were having some success. So, so I think that's a definitely a, a, an avenue we should have been extremely valuable to be able to do that across our area.
<laughs> yeah, Paul, I was just pulling up those, those CSVs, but uh, yeah, for these other sites, but I guess it doesn't flow out of all offices, whether or not displaying that is what Jamie already does or anyway, I'm sure it's doable. Okay. The other thing is, uh, I was wondering, just as you guys were talking here, some ideas, but is it rel relatively easy in the in the web environment that we have currently within the Weather Service to to ultimately kind of link link a story map? So, for example, you know, we have something that we call a graphical uh, hydromet discussion it goes out every day and and we really we need we're in a, we need to rework that but this this lends itself to that as well as, as long as there'd be a way we could you know link it into the web that's something that's just a matter of you know one link or well, I think you you would simply put your the gra you, you, whether you link to these graphics that you got here, and you update the text on there per day, and it just lives in the story map. It should be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. The the problem is it can't just live in the story map. Right. Sorry, it, this is the prime risk. Yeah, it lives here. It lives here as well. And you can link. To so. It. It's kind of a a question of duplication of effort and what's worthy of having on the story map and what's worthy of using our websites for okay so information. policy wise anything in a story map must also be available on the web public facing it depends on the content it if it's content that is available elsewhere then that's okay, but if it's content like your hydrometeorological discussion, that needs to also be somewhere on our web pages that people can access, and not just in the story map. Okay. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I understand. Yeah, and I haven't run into too much that's not available out there already. On our websites, you're on a server or somewhere. So, depending yeah. on how you read that. Anything else from anybody? Well, I appreciate you all for being here and hanging on longer and doing some more questions. Like I said, let's let's follow up and, and do another one in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Thanks. take care, all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. This is great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.